Hi, my name is Bill Brown, and I'm a board certified behavior analyst with Brett Denovian Associates. Today, we're going to be talking about joint control. Joint control is a topic that a lot of people may not have heard of, or they've heard it called a different name, joint stimulus control. What we're going to focus on specifically today is the definition, some basics of it, and how you can use it in your clinical practice. So to start, Lohenkron, in his 1998 article, defined joint control as the effect of two SDs acting jointly to exert stimulus control over a common response topography. So an easy way to think about joint control without worrying about all the technical jargon is to focus it on it like this. If you are going to engage in a behavior that can only happen based off of two very specific things, then that behavior is under joint control. For example, if you are following a GPS in a car and it tells you that you need to turn right on Oak Street, for you to be successful in engaging in the behavior that the GPS wants you to, you have to both turn right and turn right onto Oak Street. If you make a left, then you're clearly not turning onto Oak Street, and if it's on Pine Street, then you haven't done any of the behaviors that the GPS wants you to do in order to be successful. Now, what this means is we have a single terminal behavior that is under the control of two separate discriminative stimuli. So the two separate stimuli have to act together to evoke that terminal behavior. The terminal behavior itself needs to be evoked under these two conditions if and only if the two contingencies have been met. So if you have a con two contingencies but one of them by themselves could evoke that behavior, it's not acting under joint control anymore. A good example of this would be if I handed you a list of names and said, find John Smith on this list of names. The first contingency, the first SD, is my uh, verbal prompt for you to find something. And then the second is going to be you scanning down that list. So typically our first piece of this is an echoic or self-echoic. You're going to repeat these, uh, the word back in your head. So you're going to say, John Smith, John Smith, John Smith, over and over again. And then once you find it, you're going to tack that name on the list. And if you've got it correct, you find it, you present it, and then your terminal behavior is saying, here it is. OK, so let's break down the different parts of joint control. First, we have our target behavior. Now, what's really important about your target behavior is any steps that lead up to this target behavior need to be mastered. So they need to be part of your learner's repertoire. If they're not, it's going to be a lot harder. Um, now, that's not to say that you can't have things that your, your learner doesn't have related skills to. It just means that if I need to go in the kitchen and find a blue cup, if I don't know how to tack the color blue, then I'm not going to be successful in that example. So by the definition of joint control, it implies that there are only two SDs being given, but you can have more than that. Just typically, it's when we talk about it clinically, it's just the, the two SDs linked together. So what can we use joint control for? Joint control is great for getting your learners to generalize skills or display discrimination in novel settings. What it lets us do is test whether or not our learner has the bridge skills necessary to take those prerequisite skills they already have and combine them to form something new and novel. For example, if I can tact animals and I can tact colors and you give me a bin full of toys and inside that there's tons of red cats, blue cats, green cats and there's green dogs and blue cats or blue dogs. If you have me give me a color and an animal, I can take those two pieces of information together and search and discriminate. If I need to find a blue dog, I can look and see, well this is a yellow cat, that's not what I need. Toss that over my shoulder. This is a green avocado, that's not even an animal. Then once I find the actual target, I know, because I've repeated that self-echoic in my head, These are, this is the color, this is the animal I'm looking for, and now I've found it, tacked it, hand it to whoever it is that it placed the demand in the first place. Joint control also helps us teach flexibility in that learners often will have to go through a long list of things that it is not before they reach what it is. Okay, so those are some examples of how we can use them in our real life 
day to day, but how can we use it clinically? Where are we gonna use this with the uh, clients that we have in our schools, our clinics, at home? Well, the best way that you can do this is to teach them how to combine two separate programs into one. Uh, that being, if they have a tacting animals and tacting places, have them find a, go through an assortment of pictures where you're seeing if they can find the proper animal in the proper place. Uh, if you can have them use this to basically expand the stimuli that they associate with a different stimuli class, i.e. you know that you've got the broad one of animals, but you want to see furry animals versus scaled animals. And you, they can then discriminate between this animal it does not have fur, it's a, it's a lizard, so it has scales, and then it goes into this category. Another practical application of this is that increasing their manding repertoire. So having them understand that they can get the same item through various different mands. The idea here is that your, your joint control comes in from having them vary language. And this dabbles a little bit into uh, multiple control, but under joint control, you can teach this in a way that has the, the mand itself, let's say we're, you want to have someone push you uh, on a swing and your mand is push me and then, then you, you give them a push. They have another mand of I want to go higher, give them a push. Then what you do is withhold reinforcement until they can combine those two mands, push me higher. And then once they do that, you get them to go higher and higher. And then you, as you vary your reinforcement, you're going to start shaping up more and more of what is expected from them. Joint control is a big part of task analysis that we use every day in our field. Now, just because you're running a task analysis doesn't mean that every step of that is part of a joint control. If the TA has a terminal behavior that can only be accomplished by doing all the steps in there, such as a recipe for baking a cake, if you skip any one of those steps, chances are your cake's not gonna come out very good and it's not gonna be a, a, a cake. That is a recipe that exhibits joint control. If you're following a recipe like making a sandwich and I just skip a step to not put lettuce on it, that's not joint control because it's still a sandwich. So if you have any questions about joint control, because it is a very complicated topic that doesn't need to be so complicated, feel free to comment down below and I'll answer as many of them as I can. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to help us out with disseminating our science, feel free to click above.